Hey, welcome back to The Ready State. I am thrilled today to be sitting here with one of my mentors and good friends, Gary Reinel. We met maybe in 2011, is that possible? Back in- 2010 probably. 20, even 2010. Uh, notoriously, we made a video back in 2012, July 2012, where we took on a gigantic gorilla in the space of pain and the space of swelling and human performance. Uh, it was sort of a third rail topic. I've had a couple of these in my life, but this was one and it was, should we be icing? And fast forward now, eight years later, we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated in our understanding is culturally, certainly from being trainers and coaches and, and users, we understand a little more comfortable with this idea that maybe we should think differently about how we're handling waste or congestion or injury, some of the best practices. But we thought we had Gary in town, we could re-film and update the talk about should we be icing. So welcome to the Ready State, Gary. So I'm glad to have you. Thrilled to be here, thank you very much. Okay, so if you have never seen this, um, we were at the CrossFit Games. Um, the, the audio quality is dubious at best. <laughs> and uh, we, were, uh, we were very excited to sort of put this information out there. And it really did create a ripple in my community and people, um, and, and sure we said, should you be icing when you have an injury or have pain? And the ripple was, I mean, if I could sum it up in a single sentence, it would be, you can have my ice when you pry it from my cold dead hands. <laughs> like that's really what people, their sentiments seem to be like, well, what else do I do? Like, this is what I've known, this is what I've managed, this is what my mom did, my kid hurts her head, and I give her a bag of ice, like we have been indoctrinated. So let's start from the beginning and we'll just go right off, off the top is icing the best thing we should be doing for an injury? It's the worst thing you can do is sh short of beating the air with a ball peen hammer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, what, what icing does very simply is it traps the waste in and around the damaged site, it prevents the natural flow of oxygen supplies, and it causes additional damage. It's like, how, how could that possibly be a good plan? Okay, so we're gonna, you know, the, the internet scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Internet researchers come out there. People say, where is the, the science? And, and that's, a, that's an incorrect statement. The correction is, where is the research? So is there research to support the use of ASIC? There are, there's bogus research to support it. However, if you look at the worldwide reviews, there have been four worldwide reviews since 2008, and all four concluded, I'm paraphrasing for all their conclusions, but worldwide reviews four times Although popular, there's no evidence whatsoever it's beneficial. But, but you can go past that. See, what happens, unfortunately, you get caught up in the, well, can you prove that? Well, I can prove that if you put ice on your bare skin, you'll cause frostbite. So, you want, you want to prove more? Okay, I can prove if you put it over top of a superficial nerve, you'll kill the nerve. And that's why, by the way, in physical therapy school and athletic training school, they teach everyone, they'll never put the ice over top of a superficial nerve. And we also know it kills muscle cells, and it probably kills them, probably, kills the stem cells that reside around the muscle. Okay, so, so death, tissue death aside, if we take a step back and just look at the physiology, which is pretty well known around injury, like the mm -hmm. inflammatory cascade, I injure a site, we're talking about tissue disruption, what happens that is accelerated in a healing response by the body, and something you told me a long time ago was, is the body's healing response a mistake? Right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first question I think is a nice intellectual question. Is that a mistake? Is the, is the swelling a mistake? Because I, I think when we get to the bottom of this, what, what we're saying is, I, I don't ice for swelling. I ice because I have pain and the pain may be coming from swelling. Is that, is that a better way to understand for a lay person why I'm icing? Because icing definitely numbs it. That feels great. Like I don't feel anything. And is that feeling of disconnecting my brain from a local tissue because I've numbed it, is that the most efficient way to handle and facilitate a healing response? Well, I have a simple point to that. I liken that to the sympathetic bartender that gives the alcoholic a drink so it can temporarily feel better. Did you fix the problem? No. Did you make things worse? Probably. So are you sure that's what you want to do? Is your goal to make it not hurt or take away the reason it hurts? And the reason it hurts is the congestion and cells are literally suffocating and dying from the congestion and the lack of circulation. So if you step back and ask a different question and say, 
instead of how do I make it numb, how do I make it not hurt, why don't you ask the question instead, what am I trying to do? Because what you're actually trying to do, when you boil it down to what am I trying to do, what is my job as a therapist, as a clinician, your job is to prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. That's your job. So you look and you say, well, how do I prevent further loss? What's the further loss about? Well, the further loss is really relatively simple. It's the suffocating and killing of otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in the initial trauma. So what that means is the congestion starts to build to a point where, yes, it's putting pressure on nerves and making it hurt, but that's, that's not the big problem. The big problem is the stuff's going to start to die from suffocating. So we've got to decongest the area. So before we talk about making it not hurt, let's talk about what we're trying to do. We're trying to prevent further loss. Okay, well, how do you do that? We have to decongest the area. Well, how does the area decongest? Well, there's only one way out. It's not abracadabra. It's not, it doesn't evaporate. That waste has got to go back to the passive lymphatic system. There's no other path back. And you say, well, so So, how so we have, we, I'm a physical therapist playing dumb. We have, uh, we have a couple of big drainage systems. One mm -hmm. is this, vein artery nerve system, the circulatory system, bringing mm -hmm. groceries in, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and other things circulating through the body. But then we have the lymphatic system, which is where our, our immune system is working, how we're removing congestion. And that lymphatic system, lymphatic drainage, is driven through one mechanism predominantly. I mean, you can obviously use gravity and some compression, but really your body is set up to decongest how? via muscle activation. See, it's a passive system. So the lymphatic system is passive, nearly fully reliant upon muscle activation around those vessels to move the waste. And, and it has a bunch of one-way valves. So once one, the... It, and very small chambers. So when you, when you squeeze it, when the muscle squeezes it, not a superficial squeeze in the skin, but actually activating the muscles deep from the bone all the way out, everybody in between, when you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, that in effect milks the cow backwards. So it pushes the waste up a chamber. That chamber is now empty, has negative pressure, which now pulls waste out of the interstitial space and so on. So you milk the cow backwards. There is no other way to do it. There's no other path out. And what I like to call and, and look at it and say is, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to decongest the area. Well, why are you trying to decongest it? Well, because if you don't decongest it, that congestion is gonna suffocate and kill otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in the initial trauma. Well, then I need to do that. I need to evacuate the waste. Okay, well, evacuate the waste by the passive lymphatic system. It isn't a question that there's too much fluid coming in. It's not the swelling. Swelling's not a good or a bad thing. Swelling is merely the accumulation of waste at the end of the inflammatory cycle. You have not yet evacuated. That's all it is. And you go, oh, well, no, it's swelling. No, don't worry about what it is. Your, your mind has its own program of what it thinks going on. Swelling is not a good or a bad thing. It is merely the accumulation of waste at the end of the inflammatory cycle. You have not yet evacuated it. So how are you going to evacuate it? Well, quite simply, all you do is activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, and then the passive lymphatic system will move the waste through. Okay, so if, if we know, and people are saying, hey, active recovery, a recovery spin, muscle contraction is really what you're saying, activating the muscle, getting the muscle around to... to pull, push lymph out of the system is the macrophage, which is, so if I have a damaged site, my body's got to break down all that tissue, encapsulate and get it out. Is that, That's also driven through this system, right? Well, the, the macrophage is coming as a result of the damage. So it's coming in through the bloodstream, which is another reason, by the way, you wouldn't want to compress the area because the repair and cleanup crew are trying to get to the site. The macrophage is also dragging the insulin-like growth factor. So the mechanism to repair, to, to, to decongest the area, that's how you milk the cow backwards and get the waste out. But you don't want to stop the supplies and the repair crew from getting to the damaged site. Does, because it, it seems to me, I, playing devil's advocate here, that I could ice, but I could still move afterwards. Wouldn't that, was, would that work? I, I guess you could go up on the highway and you could build a roadblock and you could only let one tow truck through an hour if you had crashed with 40 cars. And I guess that would eventually work. But why in the world would you want to block the repair and cleanup crew from getting to the site? Oh, I want to make it not hurt. Decongest the area and restore circulation. 
find a neutral position and you'll have very little pain. Let me ask you this. If I numb something with ice, uh, does that change how the vasculature operates? Does well, that change the lymphatic system? Does it make it more porous or less porous? Does anything happen well, if I get things really cold? Yeah, actually it causes a backflow in the lymphatic vessels. Explain so, that. Well, what it means is that those one-way valves undo and the waste falls back into the interstitial space. So you actually make more swelling, not less. The most important thing, you're trying to preserve and regenerate tissue. That's what you're trying to do. So if you're not doing that, stop and think what you're trying to do. What if I, what if I wanna, I have a, an opponent, I'm trying to have them heal slower. Would ice be appropriate then? If he didn't mind if I, was, if I was an evil genius if and you, I was trying to... If he didn't mind causing additional damage, because remember, putting the ice on delays healing, it increases swelling, it causes additional damage, and it shuts off the signals that alert you to harmful movement, and you need those signals to prevent you from doing harmful movement, and you need the movement to solve the problem. So you say, oh, I'm going to make it not hurt. Okay, let's do a simple thing. Let's say you break your collarbone, okay? And you say, well, I'm going to make it numb so I can sleep. And I say, but when you fall asleep and you begin to distract the fracture site, are you sure you want to distract a fresh fracture site for several hours while you sleep? Wouldn't you rather be awakened by the pain and find that neutral position again and let it heal? Where in medicine did you ever hear that you should distract a fresh fracture site by making it numb? It's a complete misunderstanding of what you're trying to do. You're not trying to reduce the pain. You're trying to get rid of the reason you have the pain. And the pain is from the congestion, the lack of circulation. So the congestion is suffocating and killing otherwise perfectly healthy cells. The lack of circulation isn't allowing the waste to move back out to the lymphatic system. So you've got to restore the network around the damaged site. You don't restore the, da you don't restore the network around the damaged site and decongest the area by sitting still with a bag of ice wrapped tightly around it. Yes, you could make it not hurt, but you didn't solve the problem. One of the things that happens when a, an area has been damaged or challenged, right, whether we know we have trauma to an area is that the cell, the injured cell, puts out a chemical help call, right? Mm -hmm. Puts out a signal. And prostaglandin release is one of those things. So one of the reasons, for example, that a lot of physicians don't necessarily like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is that they may suppress that signaling from the injured site for all of the circulating tissues that come to help that site. All the stem cells, all the macrophages, all the, all the things that are part of that healing response. So yes, I, I basically cut that signal between injury site and how I'm going to repair that site, which means that my body can get on with the, the, the business of, of being, but I'm never going to repair that site. So we've seen definitely a pullback in the use of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and, and uh, aspirin, um, even, you know, uh, naproxen sodium. The question is, does ice have a similar effect? I think anti-inflammatories are a bigger problem than ice because people take those several times a day for weeks on end. Whereas ice, people will use for 15, 20 minutes, maybe do it a half a dozen times, and then they'll pretty much stop doing that. Actually, I don't think ice is the biggest problem in the rice protocol. I think compression, prolonged compression, that's a much bigger problem than just the ice. But going to the ice and saying, what is the ice going to do? Well, it's going to delay healing. It's going to slow down the metabolic process. So it's going to delay healing. It's going to increase swelling, causing that backflow from lymphatic vessels in interstitial space. So we know that's going to happen. We know it's going to cause additional damage if you leave it on long enough. Then people say, well, I don't leave it on that long. Well, then it won't work. What are you trying to do anyway? But anyway, what are you trying to do? The, the bigger question is, what are you trying to do by putting ice on it? Well, I want to prevent swelling. Are you sure you want to prevent swelling? Or, or is it that you don't want the swelling to accumulate? See, the fluid coming to the damaged site, that's being regulated by your immune system. So just look at a simple thing from your textbook. Remember this. I'm going to quote to you almost verbatim from your textbook. The damaged vessels constrict, convert ingredients into blood, the clotting factors, grow a clot, repair the vessel, dissolve the clot, and normalize flow in some three to ten days or so. Comma, big point, comma, 
The healthy surrounding vessels dilate and increase perfusion. And perfusion mean blood flow? Blood flow and the, and the release of the fluid into the area through the capillaries. So the fluid is coming on purpose. It's mobilizing the repair and cleanup crew. You don't want to stop it from getting there. What you don't want to do is leave it there. So I have a simple analogy that explains it. If you knew it was going to snow 24 inches the next 24 hours, if you knew it, if every hour on the hour you would open your front door with a good stiff broom, you could keep that one inch of snow off your sidewalk, one inch coming per hour. You could keep one inch of snow off your sidewalk, simple, be easy. If, however, you wait till morning and open your door to 24 inches of angry snow, I assure you it will not be simple and you will not clear with a good stiff broom. So why does that matter? We're looking at swelling as being an issue. It's not. It isn't a good or a bad thing. It is merely the accumulation of waste at the end of the inflammatory cycle you have not yet evacuated. You don't want to prevent the fluid from getting there. There's not too much coming. There's too little leaving. And you go, well, well then, if there's not too much coming, well, okay, let's say there's too much coming. Let's, let's, let's go for, for all the people who say, oh, no, you don't want too much to come. Okay, how much too much? Is there 5% too much, 47% too much, 92% too much? Are you different than me? Are hands different than feet? You have an answer to any of those questions? How much is too much? Hey, maybe I don't have enough. Maybe I, don't, I need more. How do you measure that? What's your criteria? Uh, What's your formula? What's your protocol? 10 minutes of icing is exactly the right for you and me, and exactly the same. To, to, I mean, you're right. Those protocols are very nonspecific and a nonspecific answer. And I think you bring up something that's really important. Maybe it's not icing. Maybe it's the way we're thinking about what's the best way to handle and handle in injury or handle swelling or handle trauma. And I, I think one of the things that I'll, you know, just in full transparency, I have been using H wave technology, this decongestant technology for a decade now. And I've got a case study that I want to talk about in just a second. If we, if we look at icing maybe as sort of the redheaded stepchild of this big conversation, right? That it, it, it is the scapegoat. Really the question is, is this the best way, is icing the best way to handle tissue trauma and healing? And the response is that doesn't look like any of the principles that I'm trying to use. Keep the musculature intact, maintain muscle mass, maintain neuromuscular connection to the tissues when they're post-surgery, post-trauma, um, restore pain-free motion, continue to circulate. Is icing helping that? Yes or no? And so that begets the next question is, is there a better way to handle this if icing isn't the best solution or maybe isn't helping? What should I do? Icing is a terrible solution. Icing missed the point. The reason that icing became popular is because back in 1978, a doctor named Dr. Gabe Merkin made up a protocol called the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Everyone knows rest. Well, everyone may know that, but Dr. Merkin, after he read my book, Ice, the Illusionary Treatment Option, Dr. Merkin publicly recanted, said I made that up in my 1978 sports medicine book. Research has clearly shown I was wrong. Don't do it, it delays healing and gives a specific reference to the fact that it causes additional damage. Now, Merkin didn't only recant. He then offer, offered to write the foreword to the second edition of my book, which your foreword is on the first edition, and the second edition has both your forewords. I wasn't gonna take you off. So I've got the guy who made up the most recognized protocol in Western medicine to not only recant, but he wrote the foreword to the book that took down his protocol. So is it the best way to handle it? No, it's a terrible way. First of all, it isn't doing what you're trying to do. When you look at the Rice Protocol and you look at the origins, just look and say, did they have the question, what, you're, what are you trying to do? You're trying to preserve, prevent further loss, and regenerate that which has been destroyed. That's what you're trying to do. Look at icing, does it do that? No, it actually does the opposite. It actually delays healing, it increases swelling, it causes additional damage, and it shuts off the signals that alert you to harmful movement, and you need those signals to alert you to harmful movement, and you need the signal, you need the movement to solve the problem. So you get the problem, you, you, you're, you're not fixing it at all. And you say, well, so, well, what does fix it? Here's what you're trying to prevent, further loss. That's the suffocation and killing of the otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in the initial trauma. That's from the congestion. 
Then you've got to restore circulation. Well, how is that done? Well, the vessels, the network around the damaged site are destroyed. That's what the bruising is. That's the bleeding. Okay, so that's what it looks like inside. You've got to rebuild that. And we're network. not talking about just big arteries. We're talking about microcirculation. Micro, the, the more the more bruising there is, the more damage there is. Okay, so you've got to rebuild that network. That network rebuilds via what's called angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is on automatic pilot somewhat. It's on somewhat in automatic pilot. But you can enhance that by activating the muscles in and around the damaged site and pushing the blood through the, uh, uh, the, the, the arteries and the arterioles, which then causes what's, uh, causes what's called sprouting angiogenesis. That helps to recapitalize, build that network back around the damaged site. So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to decongest the area and rebuild the network of vessels around the damaged site. Icing doesn't do any, doesn't, has nothing to do with it. In fact, it does the opposite. Do you think one of the reasons we held on to ice was that we were just comfortable with it, starting the, in, the, in the 60s possibly, maybe in the 70s? You know, so the first question is, has, always, has icing always been around? Has it always been part of sports medicine? Because I think two and a half million years of evolution, we're here, the last 10,000 years are really not that much different. I'm a little fatter, your femur's a little longer. But it, have we always been icing? Trauma and injury? Is that always I don't know, been where part would you have gotten the ice from? On the continent of Africa, where'd they get ice? <laughs> so in Greece, where'd they get ice? So that, that's a that's a that's a poor argument, but it's it points to the fact that icing is a relatively new phenomenon. And when we had this initial conversation, I had a lot of Chinese medicine practitioners email me and say, Thank you. Right. Icing is not something that we do. In fact, we ice dead things is the, That's correct. the phrase, right? And that works, by the way, it'll preserve a dead thing. It does. And it also slows down metabolic rate because it does. if I'm having an open heart surgery, they will pack my heart in ice to slow the whole thing down. Which perfectly reasonable to do that, that but that's not a musculoskeletal injury. What about, a, what about a really warm margarita? Is that appropriate at some point? I, I suspect if you drink alcohol, that would be something you'd enjoy. Yeah, right. You might need <laughs> ice in the eye. Okay. So, if we're, if we're at to the place where, and I've seen acronyms now out of the therapeutic sort of practices, where you came up with a different acronym besides RICE, because what we found is that inactivity is actually not the solution. We no. need to protect a, a new tissue from being overstressed, right? Correct. But inactivity is not the, the solution either. Right? Like, well, uh, how, do, how does a tendon remodel itself? How does a, through graded exposure, how does, how do these tissues, I think if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons says early mobilization is actually key to alignment of the scar even. Is that correct? Correct. It's a, that's, how, that's how we heal. We're designed to self-repair, not self-destruct. It's just a reality. So I'll say that again. We're designed to self-repair, not self-destruct. So move. You're self-destruct. You've got to load the tissue. That paper that you're referencing, I believe, is called Loading. It was written in 99 by Buckwater. And it's a great paper. It's something that everybody should understand. It, 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 uh, formally established and put into the Academy's process in 1999, over 20 years ago. I've referenced that paper to hundreds of orthopedic surgeons. So far, only one was aware of the paper. So what I've heard is okay, maybe icing isn't great and it's counter, counterproductive and slows the process down. It sure is easy because I can just get some ice and make myself feel better, right? Pretend like I'm doing something. But is there a better acronym or better solution for the person who's saying, because if, if we're going to take people's behavior away, we've got to give them a new behavior. That's well, simple. It's called ARETA. Active recovery is the answer. It's very simple. We're, we, look. Say that again. Active recovery is the, answer. is the answer. It's called ARETA. That's the first letter of all the words. What happened with that was I was being interviewed by a reporter for the Toronto Star years ago, and the reporter said, well, what's the new acronym? I said, hold on. ARETA. She said, what's that? I said, active recovery is the answer. And she said, you've been saying that for the past hour. I said, I know, but I never put the letters in front of it before. So that's right. See, when I grew up, I know this sounds a long time ago, but back in the late 50s, early 60s, to all the millennials, that's last century, okay, I know, I get it, I'm old, but our coaches told to walk us off. 
They said, walk it off, don't sit still, it'll tighten up. Never said the word lymphatics, never said anything about macrophage or infrared growth factor, none of those things were ever in the conversation. The coaches said, don't sit still, it'll tighten up, walk it off. What H-Wave does for you, it electronically walks it off. And I can do just your lateral left quad. It's like, oh, really? So, so if, I had, if I hurt my ankle, you could decongest the area in and around the damaged site without stressing the injury? Well, of course. It has to be that way. How else would you evacuate that waste? You've got to be able to walk it off. Now we can walk it off electronically now. Through What you're saying is, because this lymphatic system is a one-way branching network, like a stream kind of tributary back to the Amazon. 165,000 miles or more in everybody's body. Say that again. 165,000 or more miles in everyone's body. It all ends up in one place. It's it all comes back. And it was, yeah, well, it drops on both sides, but yes. Okay. Yes, technically. Technically. So l let me ask you this. A um, couple stuff from just up here drops yeah, that's in That's right, that's right, okay. Um, so active recovery is better. Um, no, no, and it's not better. It's the only possible solution. Okay, I, I want to go back to that. really important. This is a bit, this is a huge point. Your job is to preserve, prevent further loss. That's right. Here's the further loss categories. Suffocation and killing of otherwise perfect healthy cells that were not involved in initial trauma. That's from the congestion. And let me just jump in and say, I came out of physio school and I was given a really important piece of research where someone was using a, a cool device and they had terrible frostbite. And every time the device turned off, they had terrible pain. So they would turn the device back on, have no pain. And they did that for about 36 hours. When they finally got help, the tissue was completely frozen and the person lost their leg. Yeah. Right, frostbite. There's two things. It's reperfusion injury and, uh, and non-freezing injury. So what you're saying is potentially I, the swelling itself can cause poor circulation, poor oxygen, and I can further damage stress tissues because of the congestion. Of course, but, but more than that, it's worse than that because it's the compression and the rice part of the protocol is rest, ice, compression. So you sit still, which slows down cardiac output and movement. You put ice on it, which slows down movement. You compress it, which slows down movement. Then you elevate that part, which practically stops movement. So the very nature of how you solve a problem of decongesting an area and recapitalizing the tissue around the damaged site is via muscle activation. You've stopped it. You've stopped circulation. Of course tissue begins to die. What is, there is a, uh, a cell that's part of healing from the muscle. I think it's called a muscle stem cell. Will you talk about that for yeah, a second? Well, so if, cause if one of the things that happens, I'm thinking about like an, a knee injury and people are locked their legs out and they're icing a ton and they're having a hard time reconnecting their brain to their quads and they're doing all these quad act exercises. Um, why is it important that my muscles work as part of the system besides dumping lymphatics? That's what activates those dormant stem cells. I, mean, I have papers that explain all of this. So if you go to GaryRoundell.com, all my papers are free. There's no charge. You go print them, hand them out, however you want. Okay, there's nothing's there for a charge. But what happens is, if you if you look and say, how does the healing take place? How does it take place? You've got to decongest the area. A, you've got to get the congestion out. B, you've got to restore the network, the vascular network around the damaged site. That's from the sprouting angiogenesis. Then you've got to prevent disuse atrophy. Well, disuse atrophy is a major problem post-trauma. It's because, a big problem. People oh, never get their quad unnecessary. back. Never get their calf back. Unnecessary. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're saying... Unnecessary. Unnecessary. I don't have to lose my muscle. No, I have a paper called the Secondary Cellular Death is Actually Negligent Homicide. And you read that paper and all the references are there. I'm telling you right now that when you, <coughs> when you activate the muscle, the muscle produces and releases what's called PGC-alpha-1. The PGC-alpha-1 will, at the very least, retard or block the disuse atrophy. And you say, well, wh well wait a minute. How, how does that work? It's really simple. It's called disuse atrophy. That means you weren't using it. Now, on top of that, when you activate the muscles in and around the damaged site, not only do you decongest the area, not only do you rebuild the network of vessels back around it, but you also prevent a retard disuse atrophy. Then on top of that, on top of that, because of the muscle activation in and around the damaged site, you will reorganize the repair tissue, which of course will prevent 
hopefully if you're doing it correctly, and it does take professional guidance with very often, but if you're doing it correctly, you'll reorganize that repair tissue and you won't have faulty scarring, so the adhesions won't occur, so you in fact won't lose range of motion. Then on top of that, the prevention and retardation of disuse atrophy is huge, but there's another piece, a piece I've only realized in the past few years, and now I am nearly certain. In the past, I used to put in parentheses and say, I think I'm right, I'm nearly certain now. Myostatin levels elevate when you're inactive. Myostatin inhibits or blocks muscle regeneration. So the lower a myostatin level, you'll never guess what does it. Active recovery. Active recovery. So why does that count? Here, here's a huge point of why it matters. Disuse atrophies from disuse, right? If your immune system was making your musculature shrink, atrophy, clearly simultaneously you would not want it growing back by a lower myostatin levels. So the more disuse atrophy you have, the higher your myostatin levels. The higher the myostatin levels, the more blocking of the muscle regeneration you have. So when you activate the muscles, you prevent a retarded disuse atrophy by the PGC alpha one, which by the way also drives the angiogenesis and the mitochondria but biogenesis. Wait, isn't this just fancy for, I should move? Yes. Right. Active recovery is the answer. So, is elevation okay? I don't know what it'll do for you, and, and I, I, it, I don't think it's wrong, but I don't think it helps. Because anything that's helping in one direction is hurting in the other, if it were true. Okay, However, so. you and I walk around all day long. At the end of the day, all the blood's not in your feet. If I have get on an airplane and have cankles, mm -hmm. this is a little bit of what you're talking about. I haven't been using my legs. Yeah. I get some swelling down in my ankles. I'm puffy. Yeah. Took some pictures of us. We were on, just took a long international flight. And my ankles, I was jammed up against the window because I lost the bet to my children and couldn't move very much. And as much as I fidgeted, I had gigantic swollen feet that I did some intermittent compression on because that's what I had in the hotel room. Got my feet up and then we walked to, mo to move this around because my ankles were crap. I mean, they, I, I looked like I looked like I had a disease. In well, my, you didn't in have my a feet. disease, you had fluid that had not circulated back through your system and it accumulated in and around the site. So all you had to do was flush it out. Your lymphatics aren't broken That's because right. you get hurt. That's right. You may have lymphatic problems from certain diseases, but your lymphatic system is not broken because you're hurt. It's just not used because... Well, you stopped using it because you, you were taught the RICE protocol. Or I'm trying to protect it and I can't get a mus muscle contraction. Could no, you, I? you can get a muscle contraction, but you have to know how to walk it off electronically. Ah. And then you can get that muscle activation and solve the problem. So when we say walk it off electronically, we're talking about an FDA cleared. This is not, I work with H-Wave, this technology, but we're, this is not even a, an H-Wave advertisement, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about what are the best practices. So right now, do you work in professional sports? I do, over 100 pro teams. Okay, wait, wait, 100 pro teams? Correct. Because one of the things that we think is, hey, we're gonna use professional sport to test drive, worst case scenario. Most loading, fastest athletes, hardest turnovers, have to stay fresh, have to recover injuries at the speed that I could possibly can. How long have you been working in professional sports? 20 years. Okay. Does what is your experience using this technology? And you're talking about baseball? Baseball, football, hockey, soccer, basketball. Pretty much professional sports. MMA. What has been your experience when, because what you're telling me with 100 professional teams using this technology, they're figuring out that this is better. Active recovery is always better. Well, I'll tell you what just happened at the winter meeting in Major League Baseball. I've been doing it for years, working with the teams trying to get people to think this through. It just so happens I had just done a podcast with a gentleman named Eric Cressy, who I know that you know, and Eric just got hired by the Yankees as a new performance director for player health. I think it's the correct title. Well, Eric works with over 100 Major League Baseball players, and he's very well known in that circle. So doing a podcast with him just before the winter meeting was really good for me because I got to tell my message. And then simultaneously, Lindsay Berra, who is Yogi Berra's granddaughter, who, by the way, I believe you're, yeah, you are referenced in the article. So. We know Lindsay. So in that article, she wrote an article about why ICE is wrong. And those two things hit at the same time just before the meeting. Well, at the meeting, almost 
every person I talk to, I, and I'm meeting with all the trainers from all the teams. So I have all 30 teams, all the trainers, they're in front of me. Now, two teams at a time, they come by, you're off seven minutes, two more teams come. I said to everyone at the meeting for the first time ever, I never said this in public. I know you all know by now, but if you listen to my Eric Cressy interview, or you read the Lindsay Barrow article or both, you know my position on this. I'm telling you if you're doing the Rice Protocol, it's wrong. Here's why it's wrong, and I can prove it. Only one trainer gave me the funny face, and in the end said, would you please get me the research? I hadn't heard this before. Everyone else already knew, because I've already talked to everyone. Now, so what's the, what did I say to them? What are you trying to do? Trying to preserve, prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. Okay, how would that do that? Why, I, I, I don't think it does. No, I know it doesn't. It does the opposite. It delays healing, it increases swelling, and it causes additional damage. I know it does the opposite. So what are you going to do to solve the problem? You've got to decongest the area. Now, I've got somebody that you know, and I believe I've showed you this, this, uh, this uh, letter from him, but I, again, will give you his phone number, and he said that he'll talk to you. He's a DPT, ATC, formerly with the United States Olympic teams, okay? He now is a head trainer for a, uh, a major sports franchise, who I'll be happy to give you his name and phone number, and he agreed to talk to you. Here's exactly what he said to me in an email. Gary, I want to tell you what just happened. Had a player with a longitudinal quad tear. We measured the blood in the quad with ultrasound. Activated the muscles in and around the damaged site for six and a half hours. Following day, measured the blood in the quad with ultrasound. His word, gone, period. Turned a four to six week injury into running in three days, playing in the world championships in 10. Now, if you question me, he's going to confirm it. He'll call the trainer and he'll, and he'll confirm it. But now listen to me. The trainer then said to me, Gary, I was shocked at how fast doing what you said sped up recovery. I said it did not. He said, Gary. It doesn't speed up recovery. Human beings heal at a it specified rate. does not speed up recovery. And but what I said to him was, what you did was not speed up recovery. I simply removed the obstacles that delay recovery. So mismanaged, well, that's it right. takes four to six we weeks. We say, people sometimes say to me, I'm a, fat, I'm a quick healer. I'm like, there's no such thing. You're no. not a unicorn. You don't no. have superhuman abilities. This is the rate at which human speed, or humans heal at this speed. We know that it takes this long to you know, heal from bones. It takes this six to eight week, four to, we've got our healing times. You're either at the full range or you're not. I may not be able to speed it up, but I guarantee I can slow it down. <laughs> That's right. So the rest of the story with him is this. I said, Rick, here's what happened. If you had let that athlete sit and rest with a bag of ice wrapped tightly around it while elevated, the following day it would have been swollen down past the kneecap and the bruising would have been just a, a, been a big bruise. Three, four days later, the athlete would still be hobbling around on crutches and you would have significant suffocation and killing. And we know because this is what we've seen. For sure, you would have suffocated and killed all this because the congestion would have killed them. You'd have no vascular regeneration around the area because you're not doing anything. So there'd be no sprouting angiogenesis. Then on top of that, the faulty scarring would begin to develop as a result of the uh, lack of reorganization of repair tissue. Remember, it's inflammation repair remodel, so there'd be no remodeling. Then on top of that, the significant disuse atrophy would have caused even more loss in time because it would have been systemic disuse atrophy for the whole limb. Then on top of that, because the myostatin levels would elevate from the inactivity, it would block muscle regeneration. In the whole body. It's a systemic. It's systemic, but that limb is going to trash. So after maybe 10 days, the athlete would begin coming off the crutches and kind of hobbling on their own. You didn't speed up recovery. You simply prevent it, the greater loss. And that's the whole point. Now we know how long it takes if you don't mismanage the injury. It takes three days running, 10 days playing in a world championships. Now just a quick note, I really want to hit you on the quick note to this. Here's why it matters. That athlete played a key role in winning in the semifinals by scoring a goal. That athlete competed in the world championships and US won a gold medal. That athlete stood on the podium, got a gold medal while they played the national anthem. For the rest of that athlete's life, they get to tell those stories. 
someday to their grandchildren sitting on their knee. Now, why does that matter? If you had mismanaged that athlete, they wouldn't have been in the semifinals. Who's fault would have been? They wouldn't have been in the game, then in the finals. They wouldn't have got a gold medal, and they wouldn't have been on the podium getting a, while the national anthem was playing. No one has a right to take an athlete's stories away like that. If you mismanage the athlete, they don't go. You do it right, you decongest the area, you're running three days play in the World Championships in 10. And I will give you his phone number, and I will give you his name, <laughs> you and have. you call and do it. So there's a couple things that I think are interesting that help to build this case around, hey, we are moving on, maybe in a post-ice society around human performance. We have seen multiple, so one is that we've seen lots and lots of people into the neuromuscular electronic stimulation game. We've mm -hmm. seen that. So we know something's happening. Second is that we've seen real proliferation of blood flow restriction occlusion therapy. Mm -hmm. And that we know that the science is actually one of the best studied phenomenon in human performance and certainly around physical therapy for occlusion. And that is all about blood flow mm -hmm. and tricking the brain into turning on all the signaling for what's going on. We're seeing it, right? So it still fits with this notion that you're saying is, hey, what am I trying to do? What's my intention? To prevent, to restore, and to... What's the well, to, to preserve, prevent further loss and rebuild that which has been destroyed. So last thing I think is really interesting is that as we've seen people get excited about cold water immersion, the research that I'm comfortable with or what I've seen and is that people are saying, hey, maybe don't get as cold right after heavy training, right? Maybe we're, we're going to slow some of the adaptation effects down. So the, 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 the research, if you aren't, if you aren't, looking to prove that you're right and you're just being truthful, the research says it dampens both vascular and muscular adaptation. Now, how serious is that? Well, if you just trained really hard, why in the world would you want to do anything that even slightly dampens vascular and muscular adaptation? Now, if you tell me you're doing the ice bath because it's good discipline, good mental, you feel good about it, I'm all for it. Yeah, and what we say is put it in the morning. Put it go, as far away from your training as you can. Go ahead. It, or, but we, just remember, it's not facilitating recovery. That's right. Or we're saying, um, you know, it's, uh, well, regardless, we, we don't I want to go down this, this, the, this conversation. But what we're not trying to do is improve a localized tissue injury site. Correct. Okay. And by the way, I don't think anybody in that world, I have never seen an article where they were claiming that's the best thing for that's a sprained right. ankle. That's right. The first time I ever was aware of this notion that maybe there's a different way of handling injury through muscle activation, particularly through electronic mitigation of activation, uh, muscle activation, was when Dick Herzl, who invented the jump stretch band, wrote an article called Don't Ice That Ankle. Mm -hmm. Don't Ice That Ankle Sprain. And he Long was doing intermittent high level compression and then early motion. And so, but it wasn't static compression. Right. He was loading it up, popping it off, loading it up, popping it off. So it seems which, to me. Which just so that everyone gets, that's not what the Rice Protocol. That's not what we're saying. No, just keep it compressed. No. It's, when the, it's when they wrap the ankle and come back three days later and take the bandage off. That's prolonged compression is absolutely foolish. Now I mentioned each wave is a technology that is FDA approved for surgery, for pain. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about sort of better practice, because people are watching, and hopefully you're, you're hanging in for this, is that we have a, a, a girl who goes to school with my oldest daughter. She's a freshman. She's a high-level dancer, water polo player, and she had uh, experienced trauma in her ankle from an ankle sprain, and finally had it cleaned up, right? It was giving her the grief, and she couldn't get out. So on Friday, she stayed home from school, Ankle is terribly swollen. She's immobilized in a boot. She's been going to school, not moving. Leg is down, and her ankle is very swollen, and they had given her pain meds. And when I went over there to talk to the family about it, we want, you know, the family's like, hey, this isn't working. This is crazy. Like, her ankle is distended and swollen to the touch. We know it's not healing. Those tissues aren't knitting. These are smart people. They're like, look, how can collagen possibly knit even if it's distended? It can't. 
right? It's going to have to build a gigantic weird bag, but it's not what's happening. And then the, and the vascular network is not rebuilt. That's right. And she's at home asleep because now she's on narcotics, right? Because they don't want her to be in pain. So give her an H-wave. She's able to give herself some on-demand pain relief with a high frequency mm -hmm. mode. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, pumping upstream, not pulling on her sutures, not causing, she's pumping in a pain-free way that she can feel. And in six hours, doesn't, sleeps through the night without a pain med, feels like moving again, ankle looks like the other ankle. And I feel like we are getting involved with very complex surgeries with people. And then we're hoping that the, the magic of the healing just happens on its own and they're sort of discharged. We've done, our, surger, our surgeries are very good now when they're warranted. And yet the rehab process, we have completely disenfranchised people. And this is a classic example of a, of a young, incredibly talented athlete. And, but if she was just not even a, an athlete, she's just a young 14 year old girl who is now taking massive amounts of Vicodin for her pain, ankle isn't healing, her whole life changes at this point. That's what I feel like is at stake, is that getting this message out that we should be moving as much as possible and the technology that, you know, the way I've come to explain it is I'm like, it's, it's movement without motion. Yeah. By building this muscle contraction, I don't have to move the joint, maybe causing pain, right? I can still be in a protected range, but I'm getting all of the movement. And my experience has been that even that the brain is perceiving that this is actual movement happening without actual motion happening. And that even changes how the whole body is thinking about this as a threat. And for a girl who is in terrible pain, her ankle is throbbing, she goes home from school, takes care of the swelling, her brain doesn't even see that as a threat anymore. It's, it, it moves for her from a poorly managed post-surgical, which is wrapped, which she wasn't gonna be seen for another two weeks, right? this becomes a persistent pain, chronic pain situation. And I think about all the people that this has happened to, and it's really just, it, it drives me crazy. Well, if you, if you just stop and say, what did their protocol produce? Here's what it produced. It trapped the waste in and around the damaged site. It prevented the natural flow of oxygen supplies. It caused systemic disuse atrophy. And it suppressed muscle regeneration or tissue regeneration. Now, how could that possibly be your actual plan? Well, it is. Because, see, they missed the fundamental question. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. If they held those two questions up front and did not let anything block them, they would never tell you to sit still with a bag of ice wrapped tightly around it and let it swell. The swelling, the congestion suffocates and kills otherwise perfectly healthy cells that were not involved in initial trauma. It's wrong. You don't have to do that. We have used this technology through a lot of trauma in our family. This is, I'm such a believer because the science, not only the research, the science is good. It goes 100% with my training as a physical therapist of understanding and helping facilitate return to play, return to role in society. That's really what it's about. Forget, I mean, if your role happens to be winning a national championship, that's great. If your role is winning another national championship, great. But if your role is, I don't want, this can't hurt because I need to go pick up my kids, that's just as good a reason for us. My daughter, Georgia, a few years ago, had a terrible spiral fracture in her tibia, really bad. And it wasn't surgical. They felt like they could get it back into place. And we immediately, we started pumping within, up on our quads, not even down the inner site, within an, two hours of the site because she didn't, didn't have access to where it was, but immediately start pumping. The first time we had, and I wanted to just tell this anecdotal experience because a traumatic bony fracture of the tibia isn't just the bone. It's all of the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. It's the inner osseous membrane between the bones. It's all of those muscles being stretched at the, this position. And we asked them to change, get her out of a splint into a cast so she'd be more stable and more comfortable moving again. And they said, you don't understand we have to keep the splint on because of the swelling. And I said, she doesn't have any swelling. And we've been working on mitigating that by getting this quad to pump and pump and pump. And they fought me and to a place where Juliet was like uncomfortable. And I said, hey, you need to take this off and prove me wrong. And they took it off and they were like, she doesn't have any swelling. 
She had no <laughs> swelling in this complex <laughs> fracture because we had been sweeping off the snow every right. hour. When we went in afterwards, Georgia set the record for most time spent with this technology on. She took it to school, she slept with it, she maxed out, because it made her feel better. That was how easy it was. She used it, her leg didn't hurt, she felt better, she felt like she wanted to move, she didn't use it, felt stiff, felt compression, felt achy, move, use it. And my, my 12 year old daughter at the time is smart enough to figure out what's working and not working. When we went back in, for the final cutoff of the cast, right? 12 weeks in mo mobilized, 12 weeks. Lost no quad mass on that thing. She had no change and you, to this day, you can't tell which muscle was injured, which bony leg. Sometimes she has to say, which leg did I break? And she had bone density in that leg that they had never seen. They didn't believe what they were seeing. And that was because we were able to challenge the tissue in a safe way evacuate the, 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 the tissue, the congestion. And you know, eventually when the thing became, we just slipped the pads right down in and got the calf to work. And of we course. got the whole thing to work. We got it on our foot. As soon as it wasn't painful or we weren't gonna disrupt a, an active uh, you know, bony site. And that for me, personally speaking, was one of those inflection moments where I thought, I'm either gonna be the world's best physical therapist or I'm gonna be the greatest failure because I have set my daughter up for potentially a disabling, disfiguring injury that she's never gonna get over and her life is, is on a different sort of track at this point. And that for me is what this conversation is about. Well, and, and uh, yes, and everything you said, the reason the muscle didn't atrophy is because you activated it and it produced and released the PGC alpha one that blocks the disuse atrophy. The reason that the muscle was able to regenerate was because you lowered the myostatin levels because you're activating the muscle. Myostatin, if you remember Boy Hercules when you were probably oh, in yeah. school, well, Boy Hercules didn't have myostatin. That's why his muscles grew so big. And there's a few animals on the planet that also don't have myostatin. Very well understood. I believe it's the first myocon discovered. I think it was in 1997. I'm pretty sure of my dates, but I'm, they didn't call there, it a myocon. There's, a, there's like a whippet with huge muscles correct. and a cow with the huge, correct, right? Correct, correct. And that, that's because of the myostatin. And what happens is when you lower the myostatin level, the muscle regenerates. If, if it didn't work that way, you'd be atrophying on one side and regrowing on the other. Well, that wouldn't work. What would be the point of shrinking it if you made it grow? So the myostatin level had to elevate when you shrink. And it has to go the other way when you don't shrink. So when, when you look at your daughter and her situation, I have a simple rule, use your brain, never cause pain. But something about the H-Wave technology, here's what it's clear to do. Where do you hear the indications for use? To prevent or retard disuse atrophy, to restore local blood circulation, to maintain or increase joint range of motion, the reorganization of the repair tissue being the biggest issue of that. Because understanding that if you don't reorganize the repair tissue, you're going to get adhesions. Those adhesions are going to affect, directly impact functional movement. So you've got to reorganize the repair tissue in that remodeling phase. Well, it does that too, because that tension, that pulling on the muscle in its functional movement, that's the early stages of the reorganization. So the H-Wave technology blocks or retards tissue saturation, prevents or retards tissue saturation, restores local blood circulation, reorganizes the repair tissue, and then on top of that, the activation lowers your myostatin levels. We never do a quad activation exercise ever post ACL surgery. I don't have to, the, brain, the quads are never disconnected from the body. As soon as that- Because you're doing H-Wave. Because we're using H-Wave. Yeah, well. Right away, we start moving. Look, um, hwave.com has, H -wave is, has a lot of physicians, a lot of the, the users talking about this technology on there. 39 um, years, by the way. 39 years of doing yeah. this. It turns out that this isn't been a conversation about should I ice or not. This is a conversation about what is the body supposed to do? How am I helping that or getting in the way of this? And so keep in mind that this greater conversation has been, there are things that we absolutely can do to facilitate the normal healing response of the body to trauma or even to exercise. To remove the obstacles that block normal healing. That's the problem. That's the problem. And, and you've got to ask the right question. What are you trying to do? You're not trying to make it cold 
You're not trying to prevent swelling. Forget that. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to prevent further loss and regenerate that which has been destroyed. If that is the only thing you accept at the top, everything else you just see if it worked. And I can tell you right now that if you sit still with a bag of ice wrapped tightly around it while elevating the air, it won't work. Well, I'll tell you that my athletes will be on the podium. I love it. Gary, thanks so much. I love it. See you guys soon.